Hello and welcome to Comic Culture. I'm Terrence Dollard, a professor in the Department of Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. My guest today is artist and writer Eric Powell. Eric, welcome to Comic Culture. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Good to be here. Uh, I've got to say, uh, I've been uh, hoping to have you on the show for years because I'm a big fan of The Goon. And although I don't get to read every single issue, I, I've loved the ones that I have. And um, what I really like about the series, uh, beyond the fact that you have some of the best uh, and most expressive artwork in the business, but you have a, a real sense of humor uh, about what you're doing. And then on top of that, you're able to put in some real heartbreak. So I'm wondering, as a writer, uh, when you approach a story where maybe it's um, Richard Nixon, Frankenstein, uh, <laughs> or it's Chinatown, um, how are you looking at these stories and, and sort of, um, you know, finding the right story for you to tell that particular arc? It's really... Uh... One of the things that I, I set out with when I was creating the goon is I wanted to make something that could do absolutely anything I wanted to, any type of story I wanted to tell, I could do it in the goon. And, uh, I, I kind of, um, I don't know. I, I may just be lucky that it, it kind of works in that format. Um, but I, I, I really just don't restrict myself at all when it comes to, to the goon. I, I just, this is, if this is an idea for a story I have, I find out, I find out a way to make it work. So, uh, I, I think naturally I, I'm, I'm attracted to, uh, humor and tragedy. So those tend to be the two elements that are constantly, uh, juxtaposed in, in my work. So that's, uh, um, I don't think there's any, uh, formula or, uh, you know, uh, roadmap I'm following. It's pretty random and just, you know, going on instinct. And is, is it something where you, uh, you have the idea and you sit down at the, the drawing table and you just get started? Or is it something where you're sitting and you're writing out, uh, you know, the major beats and maybe you're going to do a couple of, you know, page descriptions or something like that? Uh, so how do you do your, your book when you do sit down? Well, the, the ideas usually come from, uh, you know, a, a small acorn of a concept. And then, you know, that could bounce around in my head for six months and I'll take a few notes, you know, and things like that. And, and then it, uh, will eventually, uh, usually I, I get a, a, a concept that I'm ready to put on paper when, uh, two different ideas that I, I didn't, uh, connect in the beginning come together. And I, I think of some linking element. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's the story. That's the that's the 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 arc. Um, so it's usually a lot of you know random thoughts and notes and everything for about six months, and then I frantically try to write something because we're working under deadlines. <laughs> so I frantically try to write something and give myself enough time to draw it. Uh, and uh, I usually I write out all the dialogue. Uh, first because uh i mean i i have the the scenes in my head already uh so i'll, I'll give myself i don't really write out a full script for myself i, I write out a few like vague descriptions when i want to you know put a reminder in there um but then it's it's usually i just write out all the dialogue and then break down my pages uh using that do you feel like you're married to the dialogue or maybe when you're sitting down and you're finally putting that page together, you, you realize maybe the expression is, is enough that you don't need that line or maybe the expression leads you in a completely different uh, direction? Yeah, I, I rely pretty heavily on the dialogue in the beginning. And then as I, I draw it, uh, I'll, I'll edit as I go. Because, you know, sometimes when you're drawing something, it's like, well, I had this idea, but that doesn't really, once you put it on paper, you kind of see the you know, it, it might not flow exactly the way you had planned. So I'll do a lot of editing as I'm drawing. Um, but I've tried, I've tried working a lot of different ways. I've tried drawing, like, uh, just drawing the story out and then dialoguing it the old, you know, Marvel way. That doesn't really work for me um, because I feel like the goon is so driven by the dialogue, the snappy uh, relationship between Goon and Frankie and, you know, and Frankie's comments to other characters and things like that, I think are such a big part of the, the book that um, it's, it would be really difficult to get that same kind of 
uh, feeling without knowing what the characters were going to say, you know, just putting something out on paper and then trying to come back after the fact and fill it in, you know, uh, it doesn't quite work out as well. Your art is, it's really interesting because it's not a traditional Marvel style uh, artwork where it's, you know, all pen and ink. Um, you combine, it looks like a little bit of everything in there. There might be some pen and ink, there might be some pencils, there might be some color. Uh, and I'm just wondering, what is it that you're doing? You've got this great Depression era aesthetic that you that you work into the goon. Uh, it looks like you ca kind of captured some of this this classic uh, Mad Magazine style, um, and some of the figures. So when you're looking at that blank page, how do you decide what approach you're going to take? It's kind of the same as uh, you know, as I was talking about with the the writing, how I kind of created this so I could do anything I wanted to do, and. Um, I don't know why, I just don't get comfortable nestling into one style. I like to experiment. I like to try out different techniques and things like that. So uh, again, with the Goon, I mean, especially if you look at the series from beginning to end, the art style changes so much through the course of all that. And uh, it's just because I want to, I, I want to experiment and I want to, uh, I want the art to fit the story too, to uh, so I can adapt the art to fit the tone and and style of the story. So uh, yeah, the the whole series to me is is uh, experimental. It's fascinating when uh, you I met you at a, a Heroes Con a few times, and you've had some of your pages there and whatnot. It's just really amazing to look at the work when it's on the page and. Uh, we were talking a little bit before we started. You had donated a piece for their uh, their annual art auction, um, and it was something that I looked at and I thought to myself, "This is clearly this is something that that it took Eric, you know, hours, months, weeks to work on." And you looked at me and you said, oh, "I did it last night." So, um, just wondering, you know, as a professional artist, uh, what, what kind of schedule are you putting yourself on to um, to create? And at what point do you have to separate? Uh, from, you know, somebody who wants to make the best page possible to somebody who says, well, I've got a deadline to hit. Yeah, it, that's the difficult part about comics. There's, I don't think there's a single uh, book I've worked on that I look at and, and am completely happy with. Uh, because I, everything that sticks out to me are the areas where I had to let it go, you know, or something was a little rushed. Um, so it, it, in working in comics, you're always under that deadline. And like I said, it, it takes a while for me to develop the stories. I'm a slow writer, but I'm a, a fast artist, um, which has helped me <laughs> uh, maintain a living. But uh, it, it doesn't help my schedule with the art because it takes so long to develop the script that, you know, where I should have had four weeks to work on a book, it gets, you know, uh, collapsed to three weeks. So um, it's de there's definitely a little bit of frustration there. I, I, I'm constantly wishing that I could just, you know, take my time on one. And I'll, I'll get there at some point, you know. I'll, there will be some time when I can work on a project and just take my time with it. Uh, I think that's a life goal at this point. <laughs> but, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's difficult working in comics and, and knowing you just got to let it go at some point. It seems like uh, in, in many professions, you are your own worst critic because you might look at something on the page that you're saying, man, I, I just missed it. Uh, but somebody else will be looking at it and saying, wow, you really, you hit that so beautifully. Uh, yeah. So when you interact with fans and they tell you something is, uh, meant something to them that maybe, you know, you were just a little underwhelmed by it. How is that validation uh, working for you as, you know, somebody looking back later on? Misty Lee, who is a, a magician and she does a lot of stuff around comics and things. Uh, she told me a story about learning how to accept a compliment and that you are always going to judge yourself. But when someone comes up and tells you like, man, that thing was really great. If you, you know say, no, that's, that was garbage. I don't, how could you like that? You know, you're insulting their taste, but at the same time, it's, it's like, I look at other people's artwork and I don't, I'm not as judgmental of their stuff 
as I am of my own. I'm a pretty, I'm a pretty harsh critic, but, um, definitely, uh, not half as hard as I am on myself. Um, but I think you, you have to be, um, uh, the people I've come across who are, uh, you know, think, think a lot of themselves usually don't do very well. (laughs) One that's, you're not going to push yourself to, to grow. And another thing you end up, you know, rubbing people the wrong way. So you're probably not, you know, do that well for yourself in the end. But, um, yeah, I think having a, a good sense of, of self self criticism is, is healthy to an extent. <laughs> and, uh, it, it I think it'll serve you well in any kind of creative capacity. You've been working on the goon for uh, a little over 20 years now, and um, somehow you can uh, keep finding new stories to tell. And I'm wondering if it's something about the character that makes you want to do it, or if it's something about you where you just get inspired and this is the perfect venue for you to, to tell that story. So can you give us a little bit of uh, an idea of, of what goes through your mind as you, you know, approach a character who's, who's getting a life of his own. I think the, the great thing for me about the goon is that it's never, it's never been a concept book. It's, it's a character book. The, the characters never really go through a, an arc like you would with a traditional type of, uh, you know, story where you, you know, the character has to develop and go through a change, you know, and everything. The, the characters in the goon are stagnant. They are, they are who they are. And I can just pick them up and plop them in any kind of story, and that's what makes the story. So I think the reason it's it's been fairly easy for me to to keep the series going after all these years is that, as I said, any kind of story idea I come up with, it's just very easy for me to insert the characters into it and go, okay, there's a story. You know, it's it's more about how these characters react to a situation versus how the situation is changing them if that makes any, any sense. Yeah, I guess in a lot of ways it becomes the, the ancillary characters too that uh, we get to see change a little bit more than the, the, the standard characters. It's always about you know so, uh, the, the villain or some other uh, character involved in the story, how they're going through their change or, or situations affecting them rather than Goon and Frankie. They're pretty, pretty set. <laughs> I've got to say, uh, Frankie is one of my favorite characters in comics uh, of all time. Uh, and oh, behind thanks. me on, on the set, there is a, a sticker of Frankie and features my favorite line of dialogue, I think, from any comic where it's just a knife to the eye. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, when, when you're writing a, a book like that, it's geared toward, the goon is geared toward, uh, I don't want to say mature in the, the, you know, beaded curtain at the video store audience, but yeah. it's, it's geared for more grown-ups. Uh, but you've also worked on some books that were geared more towards uh, an all ages uh, crowd. So um, when you're working on those sort of books, obviously you're the same person uh, and your art is uh, the same hand that's you know, creating it. So um, how do you sort of shift gears from, from that uh, grown up sense of humor to something that you know, all ages can enjoy? I think the only thing I change up when I'm, I'm working on something like The Goon and then I switch over to Chimichanga or Spook House I don't put any overt violence. Like there's not going to be someone getting stabbed in the eye. (laughs) And, uh, you know, the, I limit the gore a little bit and I, I, you know, I, I, that's about it. You know, I, I think, um, the goon has a reputation of being this kind of racy comic and there are some pretty outlandish jokes in it, but for the most part, I mean, there's, there's no nudity. There's no, real profanity. I think I've used profanity two or three times in the whole 20 year run of the goon. And I did it for an emphasis. You know, I don't personally have any problem with profanity at all, but, um, just, I never wanted the goon to get, uh, I never wanted to rely on that for the goon because it's so easy to just like, I'm going to get a cheap joke here by, you know, throwing out an F bomb or something. And I wanted to challenge myself a little bit more um, and work a little bit harder for the laughs. Um, but yeah, I think that's the only thing. I, I, I tone it down just a little bit, but uh, I think the humor kind of translates from from each. I, I think I could take a lot of the humor out of my 
kid-oriented books and put it in the goon and, and it would work just fine. Another thing uh, with the goon is that um, you have gone uh, many different routes to get the, the goon published, whether it's uh, been yourself handling the publishing or whether it's been making deals with, with uh, someone like a Dark Horse. So as this, this sort of business side of comics, how are you making sure that you're able to, um, if it is self-publishing, get the books into uh, you know, comic shops, or if it's dealing with someone like a Dark Horse, how do you work out those deals where you're able to um, you know, get them to deliver the product to the, the stores? The comic book industry is pretty, a, a pretty uh, simple um, uh, business chain, I guess you would say. Um, you know, you, you find your printer, you, you know, we have Diamond Distribution, which is, you know, up until very recently was the only distribution company, you know, you could go through. Um, I think the book market is more, uh, more of a challenge because it's, it's, it's a harder egg to crack. You know, you, you actually have to, um, uh, have diamond has their own, you know, uh, book distribution division, but there are also other, you know, Simon Schuster and, and, uh, companies like that. Um, uh, but as far as getting something in comic shops, it's it's not too terribly difficult. Uh, I'm lucky enough to have some name recognition. So uh, after leaving Dark Horse and getting back into self-publishing and starting my own company, um, I was lucky enough to, to be able to carry that name recognition over. And um, uh, we haven't it doesn't seem like we've missed a beat. Uh, I think all of my readers followed me over, so pretty happy about that. Now, I, I think I, I read that you are a four-time Eisner Award winner, um, and that, I guess, will go along with uh, that name recognition. Um, but I, I recall in one issue of The Goon, and I, I know you've done many books, and I, I'm sorry if I keep going back to The Goon, but that's, <laughs> that's the one that I, I think most fondly of. You were sort of poking fun at the endless reboots at Marvel or DC. Um, uh, and I'm wondering, uh, when you do something like that, are you ever concerned that, you know, gosh, maybe someday I'm going to need, you know, those folks and, and they might be angry with me for doing this, this poke at them? Yeah, I think I think I was a bit uh, braver in my my younger days. I, I was like, I've got to be punk rock. I've got to, you know, stick it to the man. But, you know, I, I, I also know I'm not, you know, uh, that's not the focus of my career is to work for Marvel or DC. You know, if, if a fun project comes along that I think I can execute well, I'd be more than happy to work with either of those companies. And I've done several, you know, covers and small little spot projects for Marvel uh, within the last couple of years. As far as I'm concerned, this is this is the comic this is a comic book industry. You should have a sense of humor. And if, and if you can't take a little joke, then, you know, you're just going to have to deal with it. And uh, just to let you know, Marvel, more of a sense of humor than DC. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. DC just got reshuffled. So hopefully uh, the people in charge have a little bit, of, little bit more of a sense of humor. But uh, uh, DC did not have a sense of humor about those jokes. <laughs> The comics industry is more than just, uh, it's not just comics in a comic shop, it's, it's trade paperbacks in bookstores or on Amazon. It's also other merchandise. And I, I'm thinking back to a time I was going out of town and I went to the Charlotte airport and stopped in one of the restaurants there. And on the wall, they had a, a goon lunchbox. Um, so when it, when it comes to uh, some of this other side of the business, um, how are you approaching you know, the other merchandise and, and maybe getting those trades into the bigger books uh, bookstore chain. Well, it, it's hard um, unless you're unless you're one of the you know uh, a Marvel or DC title, or you have uh, a film or a TV show. Uh, it's it's hard to get your your books out there to a wider audience. Um, the Goon is still a, at the end of the day. The Goon is still an indie comic, you know. So. Uh, uh, We've we've been able to get it out there a, a little bit. I mean, it's it's there there are definitely uh, bookstores out there carrying the goon, but it's a little few and far between. Um, so uh, it is a challenge, but uh, you know, 
you just have to work with what you can get. Well, speaking of working, uh, I'm wondering when you were sitting down at the drawing board, um, you know, are you, are you doing like some of the backgrounds might be, they look like they're an ink wash. Is this something where you are literally doing an ink wash? You're doing watercolor, uh, sort of, how are you doing uh, a typical page uh, of one of your books? Well, um, lately I've gone uh, to penciling all of my stuff digitally. It's so uh, fast and I, I've really kind of, I, I, I fought for a long time to not go into digital. I've always thought like, oh, you should have, you know, physical artwork at the end of the day. Um, but the, the technology is getting so good. It's hard, you know, and you're staring at those deadlines. It's hard not to dip into the, you know, digital well. Uh, so, um, and with the new iPads, iPad Pro, you know, when that came out, it, it really changed everything for me because you could sit there and hold it like it's a tablet. You know, it is a tablet, but I mean like an art tablet um, and, uh, and, and draw pretty naturally. Um, so I've started penciling all of my stuff digitally, um, although I take it and make a blue line and print it out on board. So there is an actual piece of artwork at the end of the day. Um, but yeah, I'll, uh, again, it's, it's, it's like I said, with the writing, a lot of it is just instinct when I'm, I don't go in with a, a, a preconceived notion of like, okay, well, I have to do this much ink, pen and ink, this much ink wash, this much pencil. It's more of, a, um, how does this panel feel? what kind of energy should it have, you know, and, and if it should be a little frantic, maybe there's a little bit more wash in there, you know, or if I want something to have a real sense of depth, you know, I'll do ink outlines and everything in the foreground and then do pencil and washes in the background just to make it give that kind of, uh, uh, camera feel to it. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, all of the, the approaches I take to the artwork is just, uh, pretty much by instinct. Well, it's it's quite an instinct because I mean I, I look at your work and it's 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 amazing because you're able to capture uh, a real cartoony feel to a lot of your characters and yet at the same time there's a sense of of uh, like a live model in the room and you're doing uh, you know an art class style portrait uh, <laughs> of some of the anatomy and uh, it's it's a wild juxtaposition of these two so I'm just I'm wondering, you know, at this point in your career, obviously you don't need references, but are you ever like, just think to yourself, you know, maybe now it's time for me to break out that, that you know, little wooden model and, and kind of work that way, or just kind of going with the flow? I still, I use reference quite a bit, um, as, especially with, you know, things that I'm not as comfortable drawing or, you know, I need uh, something to look at to make sure it's correct. But um, yeah, I, I with that kind of style change, I also noticed that when the story is more uh, serious, I tend to draw the characters, I tend to draw like goon, especially the goon. If you go back and look at some of the stories, the, the ones that are more serious in tone, he's a little bit more photorealistic. And then in the, the humor based stories, it's, he's a little car more Jack Davis. He's a little bit cartoonier. And I've noticed that the, the style uh, kind of instinctually changes to fit that, uh, the emotion of the story. Uh, again, that, that's uh, just an instinctual thing I've, I've noticed I've been doing. It's, it's really, it's, to me, it's interesting to, to talk to somebody who's been practicing their craft for a while to see, you know, there is a, it's kind of like a, you know, a musician on stage at some point they forget the chords and they just start listening to the song and it sort of yeah. comes out. That's a good comparison. I would I would agree with that. That's that's kind of the approach with the goon. I've gotten to the point where I can kind of not think about it too much and just let it let let kind of just let it flow and be what it's going to be. So Eric, I see we have about a minute left. If the people at home wanted to find out more about the goon or your art or your comics, uh, where can they find you on the web? Uh, they can go to albatrossfunnybooks.com, and uh, that's my publishing company. It's got. Uh, you know, The Goon and uh, all of my other books and several other, other titles that we're publishing. But that's uh, that would be the place to start. Eric, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to talk with me. Uh, I'd like to thank you at home for watching Comic Culture. We will see you again soon.
Comic Culture is a production of the Department of Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke.